So here we are. We are in chapter 20, which is conventional energy alternatives. So chapter 19 was um, fossil fuels, which is what we typically use. These are our traditional or conventional energy alternatives to fossil fuels. So this is a quick one. It's only 44 slides. <laughs> So this is what we're going to talk about. We're going to look at nuclear energy. We're going to look at um, costs, you know, a cost benefit analysis, some of the big debate over nuclear energy. We're going to look at um, bioenergy or biomass energy. And we're also going to look at hydroelectric power. Um, and we're going to look at why it's important that we kind of seek these energy alternatives um, rather than just stick with fossil fuels. So this is our Captain Obvious statement, a refresher from the last chapter. Uh, more than 80% of our energy comes from coal and natural gas. Um, if you look, uh, energy consumption as a whole, all right, most of it is oil, followed by coal, followed by natural gas. Bioenergy is some, and then you see nuclear, et cetera, here. If you look at energy gener or electricity generation, all right, m Again, this is probably flip-flopped now across the world, although in some developing nations, they don't have access to the natural gas that we have. So it might be skewed um, a little more in the natural gas zone now. Um, but quite a bit of electricity is generated by hydropower, whereas up here, energy consumption is a lot, um, in general, is a lot smaller. Um, but if you look at just electricity generation, a, a good chunk of our uh, electricity in the world is generated by hydropower. Um, and then there's a, a bigger slice of nuclear, too, which is why we're going to talk about them. So they're these are conventional energy alternatives because they're really well established and they're in pretty wide use. Um, they have less impact than fossil fuels, but more impact than what we're going to talk about um, in Chapter 21. So that's kind of where this piece fits in, in the big picture of things. Um, we kind of talked about this, um, so we don't need to talk about that again. So nuclear is the first one that we're going to talk about. Um, nuclear is um, when you use nuclear energy to generate electricity, and we're going to talk about what happens in the nucleus to make that happen. Um, we have the greatest production of nuclear energy, okay? So we've got the biggest capacity. But we don't use it as much. Um, France uses it a lot more, and the Ukraine, and pretty much most of these countries, ex, you know, use it almost more than we do. Um, so that's an interesting little tidbit. So it's nuclear fission. So it's actually the splitting of the atom that creates the power um, to fuel uh, nuclear reactors. Okay, so. Um, it's the, power, it's the energy that holds the nucleus together. And a nuclear reactor is a facility that's part of a power plant where that thermal energy is used to generate electricity. And I'll show you a slide in a second. So what happens is the, the nucleus of an atom is split. So it's fission, right, versus nuclear fusion, which we're going to talk about in a second. So there's this neutron that comes in. It hits a, uh, a nucleus of, you know, a... Um, a uranium-235 atom, right, because that's the isotope of uranium that's radioactive. Um, and it splits it. When it breaks, there's energy that's released, all right? And then it's that nucleus is split into nuclei of other atoms, right? So in this case, it's barium and krypton. And then there are free neutrons that exist in the reactor core, which we're going to talk about in a second, that allow this reaction to keep proceeding. It's actually kind of cool. And I'll show you guys a demo of it, um, you know, when we talk about it. So inside a reactor is something called a moderator. It's usually water or graphite that slows those neutrons that are released down. Um, so that way they can control the reaction, right? So it's a chain reaction. So the neutrons that come, these neutrons, okay, are going to go off into the reactor core and serve like this neutron to bombard, to bombard another nucleus to create more energy. Um, you need to keep this under control, all right? You need to keep this fission chain reaction under control. Otherwise, you can create essentially a nuclear bomb, 
um, and we'll talk about that. And there are these things in a reactor called control rods. Um, they're substances that absorb uh, neutrons and you can put them into the reactor core or pull them out of the reactor core to keep um, a handle on the rate of this fission chain reaction. So just like we said in the last chapter, um, the heat that's produced, this little energy pow, is the form of heat. That energy um, gets transferred to water, which converts to steam, which turns a turbine, which generates electricity. Okay, so it's just a different source for that steam. And then there are these buildings where the reactor cores are contained called containment buildings that keep the radioactivity out. So here's the picture. All right, so these are um, the fuel rods here, right? They're, in this case, it's a, a uranium fuel rod. And these are um, the control rods, these red things. They come up and down um, out of the reactor core. This, is, this whole thing is the reactor core. They come up and down out of the reactor core to allow um, the reaction to take place. If, they, if the nuclear engineers want the reaction to take place faster, they pull the moderators out. I'm sorry, the control rods out, or if they want it um, to go slower, they put the control rods in. So uh, if you notice the water, okay, so this is the primary loop, the water where that's in contact with the radioactive material is in a separate loop from the water that's used to generate electricity, okay? So ideally, you know, in theory, all of this water should, anything that's nuclear is separate from um, anything that's going to be exposed to the um, to the atmosphere. All right. So the primary loop runs through the secondary loop. This water in the secondary loop boils to make steam, which turns the turbine, which generates electricity. Um, that water is going to cool through another cooling loop. So water is going to run through and absorb the heat, um, and then it's going to be um, set out in these cooling towers before um, it goes back to cool um, the water in the condenser, okay? So that's how a nuclear power plant works. It's kind of, I think it's really interesting. Um, we're gonna do a little half-life calculation. It's probably one of the easiest math pieces we're gonna do in uh, AP Environmental. Um, so, yeah, it's super easy. So, um, all these radioactive elements have a half-life, which is the time amount of time it takes for half of the atoms uh, to uh, go from being radioactive to non-radioactive. Um, and that's one of the, the downsides of um, nuclear energy, and we're going to talk about it. So when you get you, uranium itself is mined naturally, so you can get it out of the ground. And they had a lot of uranium mines out in um, Arizona out on the Navajo Nation. And we kind of talked about that at the beginning where they, um, you know, the, they let, the government let the Navajo build their homes out of this radioactive waste, you know, the, the tailings from these mines, and they didn't tell them. Um, so the, the, you know, rates of cancer um, are kind of crazy out there. Um, but the ore that comes out is not ore that they can use in that form. They have to refine it, and they have to keep reprocessing it until at least 3% of the sample is uranium-235. 97% of the sample can be whatever it is, okay, whatever it can be. But in order for it to be considered feasible for radioactive um, nuclear energy, it needs to be at least 3% um, uranium-235. And then they put it into pellets. Um, it's uranium oxide, and then they put uh, those pellets in the fuel rods, which are, whoops, right here. So these, the little circles that you can see in there are the pellets of um, uranium fuel. So one really good thing about nuclear energy is that it's a lot cleaner than um, fossil fuels. So the IAEA, Okay, at the International Atomic Energy Agency, um, says that nuclear power, based on their calculations, reduces, uh, releases anywhere from four to 150 times fewer emissions than fossil fuel combustion. Okay, you also, if you if you live near a nuclear power plant, there's not a whole lot of air pollution. Those big, um, you know, looks like smokestacks that you see. They're actually cooling towers, and when you see stuff coming out of them, it's steam. It's not, you know nitrous oxide and, and, and sulfur dioxide and all these awful things. 
So that's one really, really compelling argument in favor of nuclear energy. We're not going to increase greenhouse gases and, and um, air pollution. But the drawbacks are really, really big. So what are you going to do with the radioactive waste and the potential for an accident at the plant? And we're going to talk about um, three accidents that have happened in terms of nuclear energy in my lifetime. Um, so you do a cost-benefit analysis. Um, governments, a lot of governments see that, you know, yes, you're going to have, you have radioactive waste to deal with and the potential for an accident, not the guarantee. But on the other side, you have so much less air pollution and, and so many fewer air issues as a result of nuclear compared to fossil fuel combustion. So that's why, you know, places do it, countries choose to do it. So this is a kind of a cool table. If you look at, um, you've got coal impacts versus nuclear impacts. Um, this is essentially a cost benefit analysis, you know, uh, a pros and cons list um, for these big impacts. Now, the, major, the more severe impact is highlighted in red. So if we count them on coal side, one, two, three, four, five, six, six more severe impacts on the coal side and three more severe impacts on the nuclear side. So just from a simple, you know, pro-con list, it really looks like nuclear is the way to go. But if you look at the cons, right, the places where the more severe impacts are on the nuclear side, potentially catastrophic widespread effects. Okay, like from my perspective, that would be something for me to say, mm, I really kind of need to think about that before, you know, I go getting rid of all my coal burning electricity generation plants and just, you know, make them all nuclear. That's definitely a cause for pause in my, in my mind. So that's fission, you split the atom. Nuclear fusion, if we could harness nuclear fusion, man, this would be fabulous. Nuclear fusion is what happens on the sun. So fission is the splitting of the atom. Fusion is the um, um, fusing, the, com the combination, combining of atom, uh, atomic nuclei um, of lighter elements, which wind up releasing energy. So a couple things, this is what the sun does. The sun does nuclear fusion. So all of the light and the heat that we get from the sun, you know, 93 million miles away is from nuclear fusion. So it's an incredible potential energy source. But in order for it to happen, you need really high temperatures and really high pressures, all right? And they've tried to do this in the Hadron Collider. I think it's in Belgium or the Netherlands. Um, and the problem with it, it requires a lot more energy to go in to make it happen than the energy that you get. So it it's not worth it in terms of, again, you guys are gonna get sick of me hearing me talk about the cost benefit analysis, but um, if we could make it happen in a way that doesn't take as much energy input, you know, we've solved our energy, um, our energy problems for the rest of humans time on the planet. So these are the accidents. Um, there were three accidents, like I said, in my lifetime um, that really kind of made the world stop and second guess the benefit of nuclear energy, all right? So Three Mile Island um, is out by Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. This happened in 1977 or 1978. I remember, um, you know, because my parents watched the Philadelphia News, I remember watching uh, lots of reports about this. Um, I remember seeing these cooling towers. So um, you've got the reactor vessel, which holds the water. And there were two things that caused um, the meltdown. Okay? It didn't completely melt down. It wasn't a total meltdown. It was a partial meltdown. Um, so you had um, water draining out of that reactor vessel, which acts um, as a coolant. So, and it's also like a moderator. So it's not going to allow the reaction to continue as fast. So it keeps the reaction in check. Um, when that happened, when, that, when those, um, that reactor vessel water started to drain, 
it allowed the reaction to continue unchecked, that, nu that chain reaction to continue unchecked. So the fuel rod started to melt. And when, that, when you melt uranium, it re releases a huge amount of radiation. Um, they didn't completely melt down, and they kept the radiation contained, so it was a near miss. Um, but I remember, like, my parents being really scared about, um, you know, what would happen, because Harrisburg is two hours away, two, three hours away, and, um, you know, the winds come from that direction. So were we, were we going to get nuclear stuff? I remember that very clearly. This I remember even more clearly, uh, because it was April 1986. I had almost turned 11, um, and uh, it was the explosion at the Chernobyl power plant in the Ukraine. Um, it sent radioactive debris into uh, the atmosphere for 10 days, and um, 31 people died as a direct result of the um, explosion, but the, um, the fallout um, covered a, a pretty big area, and we're going to look at it in a second. And thousands of more, thousands more people um, got radioactive poisoning, radio, yeah, radioactivity poisoning, and um, developed cancer. So, um, yeah, it's kind of crazy. Um, I really, really clearly remember this happening. And HBO did a, um, a six-part um, miniseries on Chernobyl. And I re now there's a lot of profanity in it, and it's kind of graphic. Um, but I really recommend that you guys take a look at it because um, there's a lot of really solid science in it. And I'm not usually one to recommend, you know, um, popular TV things related to my areas of study because a lot of it is just a bunch of bunk. So um, this is also Soviet Russia, you know, the USSR at that point. Um, so they covered it up a lot. And, um, you know, people were walking into work in uh, at nuclear power plants in like Sweden and Finland, and they were walking through um, Geiger counters that detect radioactivity, and you know they they were going off, you know, because of the radioactivity in the air, and everybody thought it was something going on um, at one of their local power plants, but then they were able to analyze um, the radioactivity in the air, and the signal was from um, Chernobyl in the Ukraine, so. Um, it probably took, I'd say, a couple weeks before um, they were able to get it under control. And uh, for, it took a lot of years before um, you, the USSR really even admitted that there was a problem. So um, when they, after it exploded, okay, after it exploded, they built a concrete sarcophagus over it, like to contain it. But in recent years, um, I think they finished it in 2016 or 2017. They built an even bigger structure to slide over it. Um, Nova has a really good documentary on how they built it. It's the um, biggest uh, movable structure that they've ever engineered anywhere on the planet. So if you're into this stuff, and like I'm totally into this, um, into this uh, event in history, um, I suggest you watch that too. And this one is much more recent. Um, 2011, there was a big earthquake that struck uh, Japan, a 9.0 earthquake, and it sent a tsunami um, uh, from offshore onshore in Japan. And there was, there's a picture of it right there, you guys can see. Um, at the Fukushima Daiichi power plant, the earthquake shut down power, um, which is not unheard of, you know, in an, and there were backup generators. But the tsunami that was generated flooded those backup generators um, that powered the control rods and the water pumps. So um, they were unable to keep that reaction moderated. And the case study you guys are going to read is about um, the fallout from that. Um, radioactivity came out of it, and, um, but it wasn't anywhere near as significant as that of Chernobyl. And they've evac they had evacuated a whole bunch of people in the um, prefecture around Fukushima Daiichi. And they um, have attempted to clean it up. And uh, they're constantly monitoring people for um, radiation effects. And there was an earthquake not that long ago, maybe a couple weeks ago, um, in 
the same area. And it was like a, a seven on the Richter scale. So, you know, a uh, hundred times less energy. But they consider that a, um, an aftershock of the, the 2011 quake 10 years later, which is kind of mind boggling to me. So that radiation, um, based on the wind patterns, made its way into the ocean. Um, they're still looking at um, long-term effects, you know, because it's only been, even though it's only, even though it's been 10 years, they're still, you know, sometimes the effects of the radiation take even longer than that. Um, and temporarily, Japan decided to shut down all of the reactors in the nation to kind of make sure that um, their safety and uh, backups, backup systems had backups in the event that this should happen again. So you can see the extent of um, extent of radiation fallout it was much less than um, after uh, Chernobyl. I think maybe because like they acknowledged it in Japan and did something about it rather than you know Soviet Union denial, which was a thing in the 80s. But most of it actually made its way east uh, over the ocean, which can have effects as well. So if um, you know, this radiation makes its way into the ocean and, you know, a lot of Japanese economy is based on fishing, you know, are, are the fish then going to have issues related to the radioactive fallout that's making its way into the ocean? It's a great question. Yet to be seen. So um, there have been other smaller incidents that haven't really made the news, but with enough safety protocols in place and, and you know, trained people to do what they need to do, um, meltdowns have been avoided. Um, so we talk about three big issues in terms of nuclear safety, um, but it's very much more the exception than the rule. Another big thing um, about radioactive material could be if you have stuff stored at power plants, because it's going to be stored before it's utilized in the nuclear reactor, and then in, you guys will find that in a second, it's also stored there afterward. Um, could terrorists, you know, you raid nuclear power plants to um, steal this radioactive material and use it in a terrorist attack? It's a great question. Um, so nuclear power plants are heavily, heavily, heavily guarded. Um, as a result of, um, you know, the end of the Cold War, uh, nuclear weapons are being converted into um, material to use at power plants. So we're, we're, we're really working hard as a, as a global community at um, reducing the risk of um, nuclear power. So here's, here's the other big problem besides the meltdown. Um, the radioactive isotopes that we use to generate nuclear energy, um, once they're spent in terms of the ability to, to generate electricity, they're still really radioactive and they stay radioactive for a long time. The half-lives of these guys, of, of like uh, uranium and stuff, are hundreds of millions of years. So even though it's not useful for us, to generate electricity, it's still radioactive and it's still dangerous. So any nuclear waste, those spent fuel rods, are being stored in cooling ponds, right? So basically in giant tanks of water, or they're being stored in big, huge, thick casks of steel, of lead, and of concrete. And in a lot of cases, they're stored underground um, to, to just reduce the the uh, atmospheric exposure. So in a lot of cases, um, they're stored at the power plant, okay? Um, like I had mentioned. So you can see the blue states have more than a thousand tons, metric tons of spent fuel. Um, that's a lot of radioactive waste sitting there. Um, People who run these power plants, nuclear managers, would really prefer to have everything in one spot rather than have it spread out all over the place. But that raises a really good question. Um, you know, so um, they do it in Sweden. They have one spot. 
um, that they're in the process of building and they're going to build it way underground, right? You know, a certain distance below the ground, bury it in the bedrock, you know, drill it, put it in a canister, that kind of thing. We had something similar planned at Yucca Mountain in Nevada. And for my entire teaching career, um, I watched the news and they would go back and forth between, you know, yes, we want to have this facility at Yucca Mountain or no, not in my backyard. We don't want that thing, that, that risk in our backyard. They chose Yucca Mountain because it was um, geologically sound um, in terms of tectonic activity and stuff. Although, you know, like I said last chapter, I wouldn't bet on anything being tectonically sound forever based on the way the earth is changing. Um, but the big, another big problem with that, so, okay, we, get, we agree, everybody agrees to have it um, at Yucca Mountain. You know, the, the local residents are like, okay, you know, we're either gonna sell our houses or it's okay to live there. We believe it's safe. But the problem is getting it from all of these places around the United States here to Nevada. You gotta take it by train. You got to take it by truck. So there's a risk involved there too of, you know, um, hijacking, of, of leakage, of anything like that. Um, so although I can see the benefit of putting it in one spot, there's also a risk of putting it in one spot. Um, a lot of this anxiety related to the disasters um, has made nuclear power less than desirable. Um, they're not cheap to build and they're not, um, they're not lasting as long as engineers who built them had expected. Um, and then when you decommission the plant, that's expensive. Like, what do you do with all of the materials that are radioactive? Um, what do you do with the land that might still have radioactive waste on it? Um, so these are all issues you know, to real issues to consider. But despite all of that, nuclear, if you look at alternatives to fossil fuel, it's one of the best ones that we have in terms of electricity generation. I mean, it's not going to work to power the car. <laughs> I don't want a, <laughs> a nuclear reaction, you know, in under the hood. Um, but as far as electricity generation goes, it's not a bad alternative. All of these downsides aside. Okay, so that's nuclear. Bioenergy, so bioenergy is getting energy from biomass, all right? So it's any organic material from living organisms or recently living organisms, and it's typically plant, okay? It's got chemical energy from, as a result of photosynthesis. So in terms of renewable versus non-renewable, um, Re this is renewable because you can keep planting like sugarcane and other crops to burn um, for, um, for energy. And another cool thing about this is that it releases no net carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. As you burn it, okay, even though you're burning it, you're not releasing additional carbon dioxide into the atmosphere because that carbon that has been absorbed into the biomass is just being released out of the biomass, okay? So that's an interesting twist on biomass energy. We get it from lots of places, okay? Uh, crop residues, ethanol, right? Um, cooking, cooked, cooking oil for biodiesel, algae for biofuels. You can literally burn cow manure um, charcoal, which is from trees, or uh, fuel wood, you know, like uh, a fireplace or a um, wood stove. Um, you can burn other stuff, too. Um, that's like leftover from other processes. So, you know, instead of the farmer leaving the corn stalks in the field to, you know, provide nutrients for um, the field for the next growing season, he can take that and burn it out of power plant to generate steam, to turn a turbine, to make electricity. All right, so wood waste from logging and burning, you can use at power plants too. So there's lots of potential options when we talk about um, using biomass as an energy source. In rural regions, in um, developing nations, they really, really use it heavily, okay? But there's a downside to it like we talked about. So they don't 
they're more, you know, these people in these in these countries and in these regions are more concerned about developing themselves rather than the ecological impacts that it's going to have, which can lead to deforestation, soil erosion, and desertification, which we're going to talk about in the last unit. Desertification is the creation of deserts. Um, when we, here in a developed country, um, we use bioenergy not so much in a direct way like they do in developing countries, but we use it to generate heat and generate electricity rather than for basic things like heating our homes and, and cooking. Um, you can use them, right? Burn them from these various areas. Um, you can also take biogas, which is essentially methane from um, bacterial decomposition in a landfill, um, and then utilize that to, um, you know, create electricity or heat your water or anything like that. I told you guys about the Shrin, power, the Shrin um, landfill. They, they're, their offices are now run from uh, landfill gas, which is kind of interesting. And just there's an example, right, of um, what you can do with it. Those Europeans are kind of revolutionary when it comes to thinking outside the box like this. So um, you can also, when you are um, committed to using bioenergy, you can grow certain kinds of plants like fescue, bamboo, and switchgrass. Bamboo grows like crazy. Um, so they grow fast enough that you can use them specifically for generating biopower. But from an ecological standpoint, you're creating a monoculture and is that species invasive? I know bamboo is invasive. So like, what's that doing to the natural balance of the ecosystem? Again, it's a, it's a cost benefit analysis deal. Um, biopower is a lot cleaner um, and it's more sustainable and contributes less to climate change. So that's a benefit. Um, So when you burn, this shouldn't be burned fossil fuels, this should be burning um, biomass, okay? Uh, the soil doesn't have the nutrients from that plant matter decomposing. So farmers who give their you know, crop waste to um, biomass energy or electricity generation are gonna have to come up with another way to um, keep their soil fertile. Um, Ethanol, okay, is uh, a fuel additive in a lot of gasoline. Um, and they use, they grow corn for it. So actually um, a huge amount of corn is grown uh, for ethanol uh, generation in the United States. It's fermentation is what it is. Flex fuel vehicles. Um, if you have a flex fuel vehicle car or truck, I, I know a lot of um, Chevys are flex fuel. So you can use um, gas that's 85% ethanol, um, which reduces a lot of um, the output uh, out of your tailpipe. But it's not, using ethanol is not a sustainable energy source. Why, Mrs. Grady? Well, because if we're gonna grow corn, right, um, we want that corn, and we're gonna talk about this again in the last unit, we want that corn to um, grow quickly and we want to get a good yield. So we're going to use pesticides to get rid of crop bugs and pests. Um, we're going to use fertilizer to make it grow. We're going to have to water it, which means that we're going to deplete fresh water. We're going to use energy to uh, plant it and harvest it and, and process it. Okay? Um, some of these other impacts of industrialized agriculture. So it sounds great, but there are costs to it too, all right? So the second piece, this is the area of corn that we grow today in the US. If we wanted to replace gas with ethanol, we would have to grow three times, four times, more, more than four times, see it helps if you read, more than four times as much acreage for um, corn, all right? So, um, you know, what's the downside of that in terms of agriculture? It's another thing to consider. Um, lots of people make biodiesel. Um, when biodiesel was first a thing not that long ago, um, a lot of like fast food restaurants 
would lock up their cooking oil uh, waste containers because people would steal it and siphon it to make biodiesel, okay? Um, it's got, you know, lower emissions. It's relatively cheap, um, non-toxic, biodegradable. And the other good thing from like a driver's perspective, you get nearly identical fuel economy. So your miles per gallon is gonna be pretty similar. Um, so that's a good thing about it. And we're looking at other ways of developing biofuels, okay? So they're actually using algae to produce biofuels. Um, even jet fuel, right? Part of the reason why um, it's really expensive to fly is because jet fuel isn't cheap. So if we can create jet fuel in a more sustainable way that's also less polluting, maybe plane ticket prices would go down, maybe. Who knows? Um, so this is that debate. Is bioenergy really carbon neutral? Um, when you burn it, it releases carbon dioxide that was pulled out by photosynthesis. So you're not, um, you're not releasing additional carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. As long as you're not using forests. Forests are a great sequesterer. I might have made that word up, a great sequesterer of carbon dioxide. Um, so if you don't use that, you know, you use like grasses and fescue and bamboo, um, you're going to be in a lot better shape in terms of uh, carbon neutrality, which is kind of what we're all going for. All right, hydroelectric power uh, or hydropower uses the kinetic energy of flowing water from a river to turn turbines to generate electricity. So we don't have steam here, but we have falling water, which turns turbines, which generates electricity. So there's two of them. Um, there's a lot of hydropower out in the West, um, as, you know, as California, Oregon, Washington, Idaho, places like that. Um, Snake River's in Washington and the Columbia River is uh, on the border of Washington and Oregon. Um, and I'll tell you guys a little story about um, my trip to Washington now almost 11 years ago to, for the capstone course for my master's degree um, about the Elwha River Dam. So uh, most hydropower uses something called a storage technique, and this is the one you're most familiar with. So they build a dam to block water to create this reservoir. The water flows through the res reservoir which goes into the powerhouse, all right? It turns the turbines, right? Which um, turns the rotor, which um, is where there are magnets which generate electricity. Um, and then that electricity is passed through um, power lines. And then the water comes out of the dam and then continues to flow down river. That was one. The run of the river is another one. It's less, um, it causes less drastic change to an ecosystem. So you pull some water out of the river, but most of the river keeps running. That, the water that you pull out of the river goes through a pipe or a channel, which goes into uh, a powerhouse, which turns a turbine, which generates electricity, and then that water is returned, okay? So it's way less disruptive to the flow of the river, but you don't get as much power um, as you normally would from, um, the first kind, the storage technique, okay? Um, so how much electricity you get is determined by the volume of water that comes through and then the distance that it falls. The more water that comes through, the bigger distance it falls, um, the more energy you're going to have. Um, pump storage is the third kind. You don't really hear too much about it. You take water from a lower reservoir to a higher reservoir and then um, you hold it up there when you don't have a lot of demand for power or it's not gonna be beneficial for you to generate power. And then when, um, when demand is high or um, you know, uh, costs are higher, you know, you're gonna get more profit, then you allow that water to flow um, back through. I, I really don't hear of that one very much. So there are good things about fossil fuels, totally renewable. Right? So that's a good thing. As long as you have water moving, as long as water keeps flowing, you're going to have hydropower. It is really efficient. The EROI, guys, is 80 to 1. Current fossil fuel oil EROI is like 11 to 1 or less. 
So that's really good. And you're not getting atmospheric pollution. No carbon dioxide, no sulfur dioxide, none of that. It sounds fabulous. But here's the problem, okay? We are altering upstream and downstream uh, riparian, right, which is riverside habitats, riverside river ecosystems. So it wasn't a reservoir before, it was a river. And now, you know, all of the, the life that was there can't be there anymore because it's totally flooded. Um, you can, uh, and you change the downstream habitat as well because you're controlling the amount of water that flows through, okay? Um, which is good for electricity generation, but it's not good for um, life downstream. And another big thing that happens when you don't allow flooding to happen, dams are really good at controlling flooding. Um, you know, the big rains come and they can meter the amount of water that comes through the dam to prevent um, flooding from happening. But the one good thing about flooding is that floodplains, where there's lots of agriculture along the rivers, um, provide nutrient-rich sediment from the river. So if you deny that flooding, you're denying that nutrient influx. So then agriculture and natural um, growth is gonna be hindered downstream. Um, dams can cause thermal pollution if the river downstream is too shallow, all right? So um, if the water is too shallow, the water warms and like life that has been living there for a long time won't be able to survive there. So you're gonna have thermal pollution. Um, if you know, the, the dam company decides that they want to um, reduce reservoir levels, if they let too much cold water out from the reservoir, you're gonna cause thermal shock again. So these organisms that have grown accustomed to this a little bit warmer temperature, you put really cold water in there, they're gonna die. And then we kind of talked about this earlier. Um, fish like salmon and other fish, they swim upstream to their breeding grounds. If you put a dam in the middle, they can't get through. So they wind up putting fish ladders up the side um, to allow the species to pass through upstream and downstream. So it's really widely used, okay, in Canada and in Brazil, right, in Norway, more than 96% of their energy is generated from hydropower, right, Venezuela relies on it pretty heavily too. But the problem is we've dammed most of the rivers, the big rivers that are going to be really good for hydropower, we've already dammed them, we can't get much more out of it, all right. So in terms of what's going to be good down the line, this hydropower is pretty much at its max, um, if not declining, because um, you know ecologists are looking at the impacts that it's had long term on the environment, and they've decided that in, you know it's more beneficial for the ecosystem to survive as it should have been, rather than the little bit of hydropower we're getting from it. So that's chapter twenty. That's conventional energy alternatives. So that's that. <laughs>